Greetings to you all in the name of Jesus. Welcome to Bible in a Year, Day 35. Halfway to 40, the number of the test. I want to commend everybody for staying with the readings and keeping up. And uh, thank you for participating in this uh, reading endeavor, Bible in a Year for all the comments and reflections that you've shared and insights that you've given. I appreciate that. This has been a tremendous blessing. Um, I've not been able to get to every single comment. Please have me excused. Um, I do read a lot of them and try to respond as much as I can and interact as much as I can, not just to make you feel good that, oh yeah, you know, Klaus responded. No, because I'm interested in what you have to say, and many times I am learning so much from all of the different perspectives and um, all of the different viewpoints and all of the different nuggets that people have received. It is adding to my inventory of knowledge and understanding, and you are helping me to become wealthy in the word. I like that. It has a nice ring to it. Wealthy in the Word. I should start a Bible study called Wealthy in the Word. Don't be trying to take my thing here and run it. <laughs> Wealthy in the Word. Amen. Glory to God. Things are being born in this thing here. Hallelujah. If you're just now joining the Bible study and this is your first time seeing one of these videos, we've been doing uh, the Bible in a Year reading plan found on the YouVersion Bible app. We are on day 35 today. Please join us where we are right here and continue the journey with us. Don't worry so much about going back to the beginning and trying to catch up. Unless you have the time and the discipline and the energy and the determination to do so, I commend you, by all means, get yourself wealthy in the Word. You like that. If not, just pick up right here and join the journey. We are traversing through the Scriptures and having a great time doing so. Let's get into the Word of God. We are still in the book of Psalms. Um, I think we might be here a couple of more days yet. I'm all right with that. I like Psalm chapter 18. Here I've highlighted a few verses from our reading that I just want to touch upon and perhaps draw an opinion out of you. We are in Psalm chapter 18. Um, I'll be looking at verse 29, 32, 34, and 36. I'm reading from the King James Version. Please feel free to follow along if you wish with whatever version you are comfortable with, or you can just listen to me dictate to you from the Old English. Psalm chapter 18, beginning with verse 29. For by thee have I run through a troop, and by my God have I leaped over a wall. Emphasis is by thee and by my God. Implication, without God, I had not been able to secure some of the victories that I've experienced in my walk and journey had it not been for the hand of God that was with me, had it not been for the empowerment of God. What a great moment here just to reflect for a brief second and think about some time that God has helped us in our struggle, in our war, in our battle, and give Him glory and honor. What a great moment to remember Almighty God who has fought for us and on our behalf. And because of Him, today, in this moment, right now, we stand victorious, triumphant because of our God's goodness. Thank you, Father. Verse 32. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. The Bible says that I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. 
Philippians 4.13. If you don't have that scripture in your arsenal, I want to urge you and I highly recommend imprint that on the tables of your heart and know that verse because it is empowering. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now that's the King James Version. Memorize it in another version if you wish. Just get it into your heart. Also, he maketh my way perfect. Am I perfect? By all means, no. Some people might think that I'm perfect or close to perfect. If you do, then I'll, I'll be praying for you because I don't know what's going on with your eyesight. Or maybe you just don't know me well enough. Glory be to God either way. However, I am not perfect. In fact, the closer I get to God, the more I realize that I need a lot of work. The more that I step into the light and walk in the light, the more I can see my flaws and my shortcomings. And consequently, the more grace I ask for, the more mercy I cry out for. And I'm so glad that the scripture says that we as children of God can come boldly to the throne of grace where we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I've made up my mind and come to the conclusion that every morning that I should become conscious upon this earth, in this here flesh, the moment I realize, ah, here am I, I know by default, oh God, I'm awake, I'm alive and well, glory be to your name, but I am in need of your grace and mercy right now. I growl at it, God, I need it right now. And then I get to roaring like a lion, I need it right now, God. <laughs> Some of you need to shout your war cry early in the morning, make the devil scared and tremble. Oh, he's awake. Oh my God, she has arisen. Run, hide the plan. This is how I would like for it to go. In my mind, it is anyways. Well, then again, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I am a devil terrorizer. You know, in the meeting halls of hell, <laughs> there <laughs> in their boardroom with all of the top executive generals, or maybe, maybe I'm not quite there yet. All right, maybe let's just be humble here. Maybe like, you know, in like the fourth level, you know, um, I don't know, in Virginia, or Newport News or something, in, in the boardrooms of Newport News in hell, where all of the little generals and principalities that are in charge of Newport News, they conspire their plan. Maybe my face is there as a terrorist. They got a little wall of terrorists that are active. And um, I hope that my face is up there because that is my intention to terrorize the devil. Devil, and if you're watching this uh, <laughs> somewhere, praise God, if you're watching this, it, it's not a secret. I want you to know that I'm coming for every prisoner in Newport News, the city where I dwell in, in Virginia, the state wherein I reside, I am coming with the wind of God at my back, girt with the strength of God and the power of his might to destroy every single work of yours that I can get my hands on. You haven't heard my most powerful prayer yet. You haven't seen the greatest move of God yet. You haven't suffered the greatest travesty in your kingdom of darkness yet. But the days are coming and behold, they are at hand right now. How do you like that? Sometimes you just got to let hell know this is what's going to happen. This is going to happen. That's right. So anyways, God makes my way perfect. It's a process. That word maketh my way perfect implies a process to me. We, if 
we've walked with God for any amount of time, certainly have been introduced to this idea of the process, the preparation for our destiny. If we've been around for some time, then we know that there are some things that we got to go through to get to where God wants us to be, to operate in the capacity which we have been ordained to or called to. So, this is rejoicing for my soul because I don't have to be perfect right now as long as I know that He is making my way perfect, that as I walk with the Master, gaining wealth in the Word and growing in grace and faith, God will perfect everything within me that's lacking. This is my confidence in Him whom I trust. I pray the same is true for you all that are watching. May the grace of God be with you and His peace cover your soul. Verse 34. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Many have asked, how do I do spiritual warfare? How do I pray? Here is the answer. He. Now, there are some things that you can do to position yourself. And the Bible, if you recall from Proverbs, it challenges us to seek out wisdom, to seek out knowledge and understanding and to grow in these things. Reading books on prayer is helpful. It can also be hurtful if you're reading the wrong material. This is why we need He. We need He to teach us how to war. He teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. My hands, my fingers is what clutches the sword. Now, of course, this is metaphorically speaking here, but the implication and application spiritually is the same nonetheless. So, God will teach you how to use the Word of God in warfare. God will teach you how to pray. The secret is, get praying. Just begin to pray. If it's possible, link up with someone who already knows how to pray, or someone that you think knows how to pray, and hear them when they pray. Listen to what they say and what they pray and what they ask for. Watch them. Observe them. Let them disciple you. This is how you learn. And take back the things you learn and apply them. And as you pray, as you begin to move out in what, what you're looking to grow in, God will teach you. God will guide you. It is the as-you-go principle. As Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, God guided him to where he was going to take him. He didn't tell him, hey, listen, this is where you're going. Here's a set of instructions on how to get there. No, no. He said, get up and go. Didn't even tell him a direction. And the same is true with any endeavor that you undertake in God. Just get started doing something. It's an act of faith. And God will guide you if you're petitioning him to. And you're open to him. Verse 36. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not slip. O oh God, how often have I found myself in slippery places? Mainly because a lot of times I've put myself there. And a lot of those, a lot of times, it was willingly and foolishly, not ignorantly. I did the wrong thing knowing it was the wrong thing to do and I despised the truth and did it anyway. Thank God for his mercy and his ability to keep me and preserve me. Did daddy punish me? It, yeah, yeah. And in a lot of cases, there were repercussions. Yet, I've also experienced the mercy of God. Am I encouraging you, oh, if you mess up, just run with it? Absolutely not, because you don't know what God's going to do. <laughs> Try him if you want to. I'm not going to. I, I've learned by experience that, Lord, you win. Your arm's too short to box with God. <laughs> He's got a way longer reach than you do, or I, or you and I combined at that 
Thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. God can catch you if you're walking in your integrity. And I'll go as far as to say, even if you reach a place to where you're weak and you're not really trying that hard anymore, God can still catch you. I did a video. Uh, it's here on YouTube and it's called Wobbling in My Walk. If this particular verse appeals to you about slipping and God catching you, I want to encourage you, check out that video, Wobbling in My Walk. It will bless you. It will encourage you. Your faith will be strengthened and there will be a refreshing to come on you and a vigor to come on you that will allow you to press and to continue in Jesus' name. I'll put that in the descriptions. So check out the descriptions. I don't think people read the descriptions. I just have them there in case someone does. I'm not sure yet, you know, how the YouTube culture goes. Maybe people do go to the descriptions. I, I suppose that there are some uh, people that they'll read the descriptions before they watch the video. I've done that a couple of times, I'm not in the custom or habit of doing so, but it's there in the descriptions. So check it out, watch it, share it, like it, comment, all of that stuff. Let YouTube know that you support DDM, Digital Disciple Ministries, Ministries, Ministries. <laughs> That's not a glitch. I was trying to do an echo. Stop playing. All right, let's go. Let's slide into hallelujah. Having a good time here. Let's slide into the New Testament. Matthew chapter 23. While I was reading this, I wanted to spend a lot of time here. And uh, because this is, this is a chance that we get to see Jesus very passionate. We've seen him before overturning the tables. I think not too many chapters ago, he's flipping the tables, flipping the script, throwing money around and just expressing his sore displeasure with the way humans have treated the house of God, which he said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. You're in here robbing people. You're in here robbing God. What's wrong with you? But here now, and remember, understand the context. Several chapters ago now, we've witnessed the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes coming and tempting Jesus. Their purpose was they wanted to show up. They wanted to tempt Jesus to see if they can catch him. Now, hey, they started it. They're picking on him and they're, they're messing with him, trying to catch him. But the wisdom of Jesus cannot be outwitted. And each and every time he left them speechless and dumbfounded with his doctrine and authority. I love reading about that. Yo, they try to come at Jesus. They're coming at Jesus. And then it's like poof, they run into a brick wall. Glory be to God. Here. We see the tables flipped. I mean, something has transpired in the Son of God, and now he is speaking with authority, and he's not holding back. And it doesn't appear that he's very polite in his speech. No, he's very direct, very straightforward, and very open. We're going to look at some of the um, things that Jesus said. I want to go to Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. And this is where he begins. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He calls them out, identifies them, and labels them hypocrites. For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. He's saying you're closing the kingdom up for people. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Again, the concept of one having to enter into the kingdom is well established in the scripture. So we see here that there are people that are trying to block other people from going into the kingdom. They themselves are not in the kingdom, though they claim they are like these Pharisees and Sadducees because they have not obeyed the Bible, 
having believed the lies and traditions of men, not having any clue as to rightly divide the word or how to even interpret the scripture, you've got to put the Bible together. And if you don't know how to do it, then find you a teacher that can help you with that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's why the Bible has given us the fivefold ministry. It's for the perfecting of the saints. You have prophets, you have apostles, you have teachers, you have evangelists, you have pastors. These are here to help you. So it's not possible that you know everything. I don't know everything. In fact, there is more that I don't know than I do. And the more I learn, the more I realize that I don't know a whole lot of a whole lot. Yeah, a whole lot of a whole lot. Wow, I just got really warm. Praise God. I hope I don't faint. I don't know what happened here. <laughs> Glory to God. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. These people are blocking people from going into the kingdom. Neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. They see them entering in. They're like, oh, no, nah, you don't have to get baptized. Oh, no, nah, you don't need the Holy Ghost. You just stay right here outside the gate. I'm, matter of fact, I'm working on a message right now that's a part of this huge series about the kingdom of God. And this particular message deals specifically with the concept of having to enter in. That it's not the same if you're standing outside of the gate. You're not in the kingdom if you're standing outside of heaven's gate. And you refuse to enter in by obeying the gospel, by obeying what Jesus said. And then you're stopping other people from doing that. Ooh, the word of God will judge you. You be careful that you're not hindering somebody else from entering into the kingdom. By the way, I take this doctrine very seriously. I'm not angry. I'm not upset. If you can see the sternness on my face, don't read it as being that. I am absolutely very serious about the doctrine of salvation for which as a teacher, I am going to give an account. So either I care or I don't believe what I'm saying and I'm just spreading garbage. You decide. For I know where I stand with my God. That was extra. May that bless you. Matthew chapter 23, verse 14. I am at 2247. Glory be to God. I mean, some days, man, it's just the time just <laughs> flies away. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, Hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Your reward is damnation, is what Jesus is saying. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye, compa for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Jesus ain't playing. He's saying you are a hypocrite. He's calling them blind. He's calling them serpents. He's saying you are a child of hell. Your reward will be damnation if you don't cut your mess out. This is very stern. Very real talk from Jesus. Was Jesus angry? Probably. He was probably working with some feelings, righteous indignation. You know, in all of this right here, Jesus didn't once sin. In calling out these scribes and Pharisees, Jesus didn't once sin. In calling them blind and saying, you hypocrite, you're going to be damned if you don't cut out what you're doing. Jesus didn't sin. Everything he said was righteous and just. And he was within the law in doing so. Can you imagine Christ Jesus in whom the fullness of God dwelt speaking with such authority and such strong rebuke? 
I imagine that if I were a Pharisee, my feelings would be hurt, and I would conspire to have this man killed. You've got to go, Joe. You're jacking up my flow right here, and I don't like it one bit. And isn't that exactly what the Pharisees did, along with the scribes and all of these that opposed Jesus? There are several more verses that continue in this. Look at, for example, verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup of the, and the platter, but within are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Hmm. He puts them on blast. In verse 33, this is what he says. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? At this point, you can see the emotion of the moment is transitioning. And Jesus it seems, switches here in verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. I imagine that that is hurtful to a loving God. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. I can imagine Jesus saying this with tears escaping his eyes. He can't hold it back. He can't fight it back. Tears are flowing. With deep emotional content, he says, For I say unto you, Ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Psalm chapter 122 verse 6 tells us this. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. I would like to invite you right now, while this video is going on, take a moment, pause it, and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Take a couple of minutes and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And then pick up with Elihu for the few minutes that we have remaining. Praise God. Good to see you back. Thank you for joining me in prayer for the peace of Jerusalem. Elihu. Elihu? Who that be? Who is Elihu? We're trying to figure out. So now that we've heard Elihu speak, what what has he said that we haven't heard already? Here's some points of contemplation. It seems to me that Elihu be a man of integrity. I did that on purpose. You know I did. Job 33, verse 4. This is what Elihu says. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Behold, verse 6, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. Seems to be a humble approach. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid, neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. Please consider what I'm saying. Don't take this the wrong way. I don't mean to be a jerk. I just want to help. Now, mind you, in the chapter before, it was clearly stated that the anger of Elihu was kindled or or was it wrath <laughs> something was kindled i i don't know why i like that when the bible says that his wrath was kindled against him i imagine this little flame flickering in their chest 
the anger. Oftentimes, people have kindled my anger. And in my mind, I saw this little flame flickering. <laughs> Don't do that, though. Don't try to kindle my anger because I need help. <laughs> All right. Praise God. But this, this is, I don't know why, maybe because I watched a lot of cartoons as a kid. This is how I see life a lot of times as a cartoon representation in my mind. I don't know. Praise God. To him be glory. It'll all go away when the trumpet sounds. <laughs> but it, it looks like Elihu is a humble guy right here. And he goes through the spiel. Job, you did this, you did that. Same thing that we've heard from Zafar so far, from Bildad the Shuhite, and from Eliphaz. Eliphaz, Eliphaz, however you wish to uh, enunciate that name. Let's go to Job 33, 33. Elihu, is he arrogant or honorable? What is his motive? What is his heart intent here? In verse 33, he says, If not, hearken unto me, hold thy peace and I shall teach thee wisdom. Now, we're left here with a cliffhanger again because I didn't go ahead to see what to make of all of this. If you did, please, no, no spoiler alert, let's speculate right here. What do you think, Elihu? Man of integrity, honorable, or arrogant and prideful? Drop a comment below. Tell me your mind. Perhaps you have a reason why. Until then, we'll see you next time. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the wind of the Spirit of God be at your back. And may His face ever be before you. Grace be with you and peace.